Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading for Friday, <laughs> February 25th, 2022. Definitely going up on a Saturday this time around. Uh, my last video, which was my literary uh, journals review, took a little longer than expected earlier this week, so I just got that one up as well. But uh, I'm proud of the work I put into that one, so I'll link it down below. I spent that video reading and discussing short stories written in literary magazines. And on the note of short stories, I return as always in these AM reading videos of late to Dorothy Parker's uh, collected stories. I've been reading one story per AM reading video since last May. And uh, today I am discussing the story Horsey, which she published in 1932. This is a departure from her norm, her dashed off stories, usually highly critical of uh, men and mostly women in social situations. Uh, it is still, I think, pretty critical of uh, men and women in social situations, but it's more complicated because it's a longer story. Uh, and it's uh, less unfavorable overall toward uh, the female characters, I think. <laughs> this uh, chronicles uh, the Kruger family, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kruger, Gerald and Camilla Kruger, who just gave birth, well, you know, Camilla just gave birth to a baby, Diane, and, you know, she needs help for a while. She is uh, recuperating from the birth, uh, and so she returns home with baby Diane and with a nurse. The nurse is named Miss Wilmarth, and uh, she is not beloved by, uh, the Kruger uh, couple. <laughs> uh, there's a few reasons for this. The one that is most extrapolated upon is the fact that she is a homely woman who apparently looks a bit like a horse and Parker being the, I think, satirist that she is, has a lot of lines in here about uh, how that uh, how that, complexion, how that complexion works and uh, how Mr. Kruger especially makes fun of it. <laughs> It's definitely not too politically correct uh, in that way. Although I don't necessarily think the Krugers are supposed to come off as overly sympathetic. Um, they also don't necessarily like how jovial she is. You know, she talks to Diane in the, me, 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 you know, adult voice, cuckoo voice that uh, they sometimes use with children. She's overly, uh, emotionally exuberant uh, in her conversations, and Mr. Kruger feels obliged to uh, have dinner with her every night. And I think this is getting more to their actual issue with this woman, or part of it. Uh, as a nurse, she inhabits a strange place in the family, albeit only for five weeks, but still, because she's not a servant, but she's not, you know, the family either. So the fact that uh, she's, uh, I guess, a culturally not supposed to be eating with the servants and instead uh, Mr. Kruger should be treating her more as one of his own station. That bothers him. So I do feel like there's just a sense of classism and snobbery going on here as well. And it could even, I could be reaching for this, but the fact that she's, you know, this homely woman who's unattached uh, to, you know, family could also be part of why it's easy to denigrate her. <laughs> Uh, but certainly I think the part about uh, how put off he is by having to actually, you know, treat her with the dignity of having to eat with her and, you know, treat her almost like someone of his own station uh, really gets to him. And to Camilla, too, who spends all of her time whining. <laughs> I mean, she's recuperating and there seems to be a little bit of attention paid to, oh, you know, this is kind of exhausting to have to recuperate from giving birth. But she takes most of it out on, like, you know whining about how horrible it is to be with this nurse who's spending her time taking care of her, so, you know. And it's kind of depressing in its way because Miss Wilmarth is never the wiser about how much these people are mocking her and dislike her company. Even when it seems like they, she should be aware of it, it seems like they, you know, mock her and use this horsey language all the time. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but she's always not only so, you know, upbeat and cheerful, but she's also deeply grateful to them all the time, just, you know, for talking to her. <laughs> uh, 
And at the end, when she finally does leave, um, uh, Mr. Kruger goes out to get her flowers and she fawns over him over this. And of course he does it, he claims to Camilla because, oh, we're, I'm just, I was celebrating her departure, <laughs> you know, uh, so it was a sense of meanness again. But, you know, we end with uh, this woman, uh, this nurse who, in the car. He's, she is going home in uh, his car. Uh, and there is also a line where uh, she mentions like her mother for the first time and like the Krugers are taken aback by the fact that this woman might actually have a family and a life beyond their mockery of her. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she they do take her home or like the driver takes her home and the last lines are her being so, you know, grateful for these flowers and this attention from a man, which I guess, again, feeds into the idea of, you know, how uh, ostracized she might be as not attached to a man on her own. So I don't know, it's a little depressing in a way that she uh, didn't catch on, but maybe on the opposite tack, it isn't so depressing. You know, she gets to stay happy in her life. You could even perhaps uh, give a little bit of grace to Mr. Kruger for doing a couple nice things for her, even if it was for mean reasons. Uh, the end result perhaps is the same. Speaking of social commentary of a sort, the first book I finished this week was A Fortunate Age by Joanna Smith Rakoff. I think that's how you're, you actually say her name. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, this was uh, at the top of my Goodreads uh, TBR uh, at the beginning of the month, so I was happy to dash it off. It uh, takes place uh, between roughly 1998 and 2004, following a group of Gen Xers who uh, are around graduate school age who move to New York. They are pursuing postgraduate uh, uh, lives uh, in academia or in uh, the arts of some sort, like, you know, um, mostly acting, actually, a little bit of music. But uh, most of these main characters, this group of friends who met at Oberlin uh, for undergrad, most of them do end up married and often with kids by the end of this story. So it's about changing mores in its way. But it's mostly about following them through uh, their dramatics, I'll say. These are all highly educated people. The English majors in particular just have such a sense of self that's imbued in their, you know, study of classical literature and uh, Sadie, who I think might be the main character, wants to be this arbiter of culture. So she joins a literary agency, but like at the end, she's pretty much burned out by it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of drama with uh, changing sexual relationships. Uh, a lot of stuff in that department especially feels a little bit uh, overly dramatic and overly convenient plot-wise. I was engrossed in the book as I was reading it, but at the end of the day, I feel like there are too many characters and there wasn't enough social commentary, I don't think, until the very end, which encompasses 9-11 and how that changes people's outlooks. So in a way, that sort of commentary, both on perhaps Gen X about how carefree they could be until they couldn't be anymore, but maybe that's also the country as well. <laughs> for, for the most part, uh, Rakoff kept politics at a minimum, except uh, for some uh, side characters who dealt in anarchist movements. Uh, and I felt like uh, maybe I'm bringing the present too much into it about uh, the idea of how to interact with the radical left and how things have shifted and how, you know, this so-called radical left is certainly not as radical anymore in discourse. But one thing I guess I appreciated a little being more moderate myself is uh, how it was easier to uh, criticize people for like overly binary thinking, I think, back then. Whereas now some political theory uh, that might have once been called uh, anarchist is now like puritanical in the sense of, you know, either you believe it and are a good person or you don't and you're a bad person. But this again could be me uh, projecting <laughs> a little bit onto this novel. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, I wish there were fewer characters so that we could flesh the most uh, significant ones out a little bit. I mean, there is a structure to the novel in that it begins with a wedding and it ends with a funeral. So we see how uh, these characters' lives uh, change in between. Kinda, sorta. Again, there are so many characters and I feel like I would be more okay with this many characters in a novel like this if there was more external plot to make them more interesting, I think. 
I feel like I'm always guesstimating in a way about like when I don't like something in books, what do I think the uh, writer could have changed for me to like it better. <laughs> Maybe it's part of uh, being a writer myself and a workshopper. But to end on a couple of cool notes, I actually like this cover a lot. This, this actual cover is kind of onion skinny and when you uh, take it off uh, you see how actually it's on the hardback is uh, these uh, people who, you know, don't look that interesting on the hardback. But when you put this onion skin back on, it's like putting the New York skyline and, you know, they're looming over it and it becomes a lot more interesting, I think. Yeah. And another thing I feel like I should say about Rakoff, um, now that I can say her name correctly, I think, is because she's more well known uh, for her memoir. This novel has some, I believe, autobiographical uh, aspects to it, but her memoir, of course, is much more autobiographical in which she talks about uh, working at a literary agency uh, and uh, answering fan mail that came to J.D. Salinger back in the day. And in fact, that memoir it was recently turned into a movie last year, so I thought I'd leave the trailer down below. There might be a little bit of a camera angle change here because I decided I wanted to see about refilming uh, the part where I talk about this next book I just finished. This is nonfiction essays. People Love Dead Jews reports from a haunted present by Dora Horn, which I think might be my favorite read so far of the year, uh, largely because I struggled with it, uh, but there were just a lot of truths in it, but also, you know, not easy truths by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I'm still grappling with uh, where I fit in with uh, what she's saying, where I agree or disagree or all that. Uh, I'm hoping to write my Goodreads review soon. But anyway, uh, yeah, these are um, essays about the Jewish experience, broadly speaking, I guess fitting into the mold of uh, recent essays and uh, works by marginalized people, often with a lot of anger or uh, righteousness about uh, the experiences that uh, marginalized people have and uh, the blind spots uh, in broader society. So this one, I guess, is, uh, you know, personally affecting because it's about my community. Uh, there's 12 essays in here, so it covers a lot. Broadly speaking, I think Horn means to criticize a lot of institutions that uh, we've taken the easy road with and not challenged enough about uh, the veracity of what they're doing, the motivations of what they're doing, and uh, most importantly, just uh, what it means uh, to the living Jewish community, what they're doing. Uh, particularly in this weird Western age we live in, mostly Western age. Uh, there's one essay actually that's similar that takes place in China, but this age of um, venerating dead Jews, but anti-Semitism toward living Jews being on the rise and what that means. And she also dissects culture and uh, the uh, stories we tell ourselves there, like particularly with Shylock. Uh, I identified a lot with that one because much like uh, Horn, I was a teenage uh, Jewish girl in a secular school. Well, actually, no, mine wasn't secular, but anyway, uh, mine was a Christian school where I was being told basically, you're wrong if you think this uh, play isn't philo-Semitic on Shakespeare's part. And I'm like, eh? And I feel like Horn gave me some of the language back to deal with that. The largest essay in here deals uh, with uh, the uh, righteous Gentile. It's a term given to the minuscule amount of non-Jews who spent their time uh, trying to save Jews from the Holocaust, Varian Fry. Uh, he's a complicated man with a complicated legacy. I feel like this essay uh, might particularly uh, be of uh, use. It not only talks about the types of people who throw themselves into that, to that danger, it also talks about the atmosphere, the environment of uh, xenophobia, and I guess uh, this sort of thing might especially be of interest right now. I was thinking a fair bit about uh, Russia's military action against uh, Ukraine, their uh, military advance into the country, the, the deaths and violence that are occurring there now because of that, and uh, the types of responses that people might have in the world to those refugees. That's a universal sort of, I guess, application, although a lot of these essays do challenge the idea of how Jews are often used as a metaphor, uh, as a mirror uh, for uh, other people, so that you don't look at us as being Jews, you look at us 
as uh, being sort of the, uh, the canary in the coal mine about the types of uh, xenophobia that might be coming for the rest of you. <laughs> In large part, I think uh, Horn and I are on the same page. I do think she has uh, her own biases uh, of opinion sometimes, some which are similar to mine, like our Ashkenazi heritage. Some are slightly more different in that she's far more learned than I am uh, in uh, religion and uh, in uh, culture even. She is a uh, scholar of uh, Yiddish and Hebrew literature and a uh, novelist. But overall, I feel like She's a very compelling voice to bring the Jewish perspective to light in this manner. She's incredibly intelligent and uh, like a lot of people who've had t too much, she's uh, no holding uh, no holds barred on anything she's really saying here. And I guess uh, in the spirit of that, I'll link to a podcast uh, where she speaks in her own words about uh, what she's writing here. And I definitely do recommend this book. We have just a couple days left in February, and I have two books that I'd like to at least start before the end of the month. The first being a big chunkster. This is The Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls, which is technically a book on the Book 2 Prize long list for fiction right now. Uh, but I am not reading it for the Book 2 Prize. I'm actually reading it for my mom and auntie's book club. My mom suggested this book. Uh, and since I'm not reading it for the prize, I think I can talk about it. I don't think I probably will on these videos because I'm about to start a new month for my next damn reading. But I do think I'll be able to post my Goodreads review if and when I finish this baby. <laughs> um, and this is the book that I want to at least start uh, because I do need to read it for my particular BookTube prize uh, judging ballot. Uh, this is uh, Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi, which I believe is about... Uh, mother-daughter relationships in India, but I won't be saying any more about this book until uh, the uh, Book 2 Prize octafinals have completed at the end of March. The Book 2 Prize uh, was started by Robert at Barter Hordes a couple of years ago, wherein over 300 judges across the globe are looking at uh, literary fiction, nonfiction, and translated fiction published in the U.S. and English in uh, 2021. Uh, and we're in the first round right now, but we have several more to go before we get to the winners. Uh, and as an official judge, I will stay mum, at least on uh, the ones I am reading for the prize. This one, I will. I feel less compunction to keep quiet about because my uh, voice for it doesn't matter in the octafinals round. <laughs> so anyway, I did talk about preliminary thoughts on my uh, octafinals judging round uh, at the beginning of the month, so I will link to that video and to more Book 2 Prize information down below. So that about covers it for me now, and yeah, my weekend plans are kind of sort of to try to finish this entire book in the weekend. Uh, it is uh, almost 600 pages long, so <laughs> I mean, I'm also going to be doing some other stuff uh, over the weekend, but hopefully it'll be relatively quiet and uh, sane. <laughs> it's kind of crazy because I left some of the biggest books that I have to read for the Book 2 Prize for next month. <laughs> uh, I'm doing some magical thinking, I think, uh, by pretending that the few days uh, longer in March uh, make it easier for me to uh, read uh, heftier books than it would in uh, February. But I am overall uh, very uh, happy with my February progress so far. Hopefully I will have at least started uh, book 10 of my February reading uh, by the 28th. <laughs> I mean, who oh boy, I just had a colleague uh, uh, offer to give me DVDs of his favorite uh, TV show that maybe I could watch, or, you know, I heard of a uh, new book club uh, that might be uh, starting through my local JCC that sounds interesting, but I have to say no to most of that stuff or all of that stuff right now because I am feeling overwhelmed by my own uh, reading and writing and otherwise goals in my life, so gotta know your limits, I guess. And that being said, you will see me next on this channel within the next couple of days to talk about my latest book haul of books uh, I think I largely am uh, intending to read really soon or might already be in the process of reading or that sort of thing, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> and I think I've rambled on enough here, so thank you all so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.